when we began to think about what would be an appropriate way to recognize uh, the ministry of Jerem Bars, uh, what would be an appropriate way to uh, remind uh, others and encourage others of the ways in which God has worked through Jerem. Uh, some of us put our heads together around the idea uh, of a book. Uh, many of you will know that in academic circles there are such things called feshrifts. Uh, feshrifts are collections written by peers, colleagues, other academics that contribute from their learning around a theme to honour one most frequently whom they've learned from. And so beginning a couple of years ago, we began to sit down and think about uh, how we would honour Jerem. And we took this idea of the feshrift and we began to contact students of Jerem's and colleagues of Jerem's and significant uh, men and women in Jerem's uh, life. And uh, what I had the privilege of hearing again and again was wonderful uh, accounts of the ways in which Jerem's ministry uh, had impacted them, touched them, equipped them. Uh, and the volume that we'd like to present to Jerem, First Fruits of a New Creation, Honours, uh, essays honoring Jerem Bars. We have students who've benefited from Jerem's ministry here at Covenant Seminary. We have uh, leaders uh, from the Labrie movement around the world who also wish to bear testimony to Jerem's uh, many years of service in Labrie, in Switzerland, and in England. Uh, we have seminary faculty and even presidents from other seminaries, from other institutions that have been uh, willing to express. We also have a number of delightful student testimonies who bring in their own colourful way moments from the classroom. And just before we present this book to Jerem, I'm going to ask one of the contributors, Dr. Zach Eswine, just to come up and to take a few moments here as well. Uh, many today uh, struggle to believe in God. Uh, simply because they come from a broken home. Statistics show that those who come from a broken home are much less likely to believe in God or to attend church than those who grow up in intact families. And so I was one of those uh, young men. My first presbytery meeting that I attended uh, with my long hair and jeans and uh, earring hole and uh, someone said out loud, um, that's no Presbyterian. And uh, so as I came to Covenant Seminary, longing, longing to have answers and questions, not just for a generation that I hope to minister to, but for my own life, I came to an apologetics and outreach class. And Jerem was there, and he was opening Psalm 10. And as he opened Psalm 10 and spoke of victims of crime, telling out a story from his own life, the tears began to fall from him. And I learned two things in that moment. One, uh, objections, questions, challenges to the faith come, yes, from skepticisms, but also our deepest questions of a generation can arise from our sorrows. And I learned a second thing that day. An apologist is savvy and able to reason with the questions of a generation and a human being. But an apologist is also able to cry with the pains and sorrows of a generation and a human being. And you know, I can confidently say um, that that has given us at Covenant Seminary a distinctive voice. Jerem's presence has given us a distinctive voice. Uh, you can learn apologetics wonderfully at many good sister seminaries, people who train us well, but no one does it like we do it here because sorrows and skepticisms drive us deeper than what's our approach, what's our philosophy to the question of connecting apologetics with double love. An apologist uh, does apologetics as an aspect of that call to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength, to love our neighbor, including our enemy, as ourself. 
And that changes everything about the way you teach and practice apologetics. We have a distinctive voice here at Covenant Seminary. And not only in apologetics, but also theology of ministry. If neighbor love is connected to the heartbeat of everything that do, we do, that does mean that we have learned from Jerem a deep, rich heritage, uh, reformed theological heritage of pastoral ministry and ministry leadership. But it has also meant that we have come with our tears and we've come to recognize what Francis Schaeffer called the person without the Bible or the person holding the Bible that doesn't understand it or misunderstands it. And what does it mean in ministry to lead and care for those kinds of people and human beings? We have a distinctive theology of ministry, but also a distinctive approach to preaching. I can tell you without exaggeration, there is no one in this country that teaches preaching the way Covenant Seminary does. Yes, we learned to preach the Bible for Dr. Robert Rayburn. And yes, wonderfully, we learn to preach Christ from that in, in, uh, errant, infallible word through Brian Chapel. But it's Jerem who has taught us all along the way that whenever we communicate the scriptures, the person without the Bible is to be on our mind. Their doubts, their sorrows, their skepticisms, this moment, this generation, now. What is Christ from the scriptures, from a prayerful, humble disposition of dependence upon the Spirit, lead us to? And that approach changes everything. We have a distinctive voice. And of course, Jerem's bringing all of that to his love for artists and artistry and the delight of God's world and giving himself all of this in such a way that his colleagues flourish. And so each colleague, faculty member, isn't Jerem. And that's okay with him. He's rather glad. Saying that among his happiest days of the week is a faculty meeting. Not trying to rob anyone from their strengths and contributions, but somehow in the midst of that, as everyone else shines with their strengths and their weaknesses, his quiet, Steady, distinctive humility helps us all. And that has made us a distinctive place with a distinctive voice. And now as we look for the next 30 years, I believe we can say we have a distinctive voice for a restless generation. This generation now is restless with church leaving in droves, restless because the, the, the Pew Center and others tell us, all of those who study these things, restless because the church isn't a place where people can, answer, can ask their honest questions. And so they're restless with church and leaving. Another reason young generations are leaving the church is that the church isn't a place where their sorrows are welcomed. No hospitality to their sorrow. And another place they're being restless with church is the living room. No living room with mentors there. No living room that's congruent with the public face they experience in the sanctuary. And in that light, uh, Jeremy, you for the last 30 years have positioned us, poised us uniquely to handle the sorrows and skepticisms of this coming generation. I uh, am thinking about the living room. I remember two scenarios. One, I'd come to meet with Jerem in uh, the old Rayburn house uh, across the way there when the Schaefer Institute was there. And uh, I came to have lunch with him as many of you have done. And uh, he served lunch for us, and then as a seminary student, as we walked away, Jerem, I, I looked at you and I said, should we have your secretary wash our dishes? Jerem walked a little bit farther and then paused and then turned and, you know, <laughs> looking over, looking over his glasses, he said in the most gentle, 
but firm way. Zach, my secretary, is not our maid. We can do our own dishes. And I am seeing there, you see, he's preparing me. That apologetics and a theology of ministry and a, uh, preaching gifts all flow out of a prior disposition, a way of being that has practical implications for how you handle dishes and the dignity of a secretary. Many years later, at a, when the floor was falling out uh, from my life, I had remembered something Jeremy had often said. He had just said, stop by our house. He said that to, to folks. It's not something we Americans do, but uh, I guess where he's from, people just stop over. And I was full of grief. And I thought, I'm just going to stop over. Well, I knocked on the door, and uh, Jerem had just been out in the garden, and so uh, was quite sweaty from a hot summer day's work, uh, pr uh, probably not uh, wearing and feeling uh, ready to welcome someone, but he sure did. Welcomed me right in. He and Vicky made some sandwiches and tea. We sat in their living room. And as we sat there and I shared my own grief and they empathize with me in the living room, you see I'm seeing the congruence between a living room and a public face. And a person like myself with my own doubts and skepticisms, even as a ministry leader, needs such a thing. And as he heard anger in my heart, gently said, Zach, remember, Anger does not bring about the kingdom of God. Jerem, thank you. Thank you as you lead us still. I don't know if you're aware of it, but for 30 years, you've been preparing us for the next 30. You have shown us how a living room, how honest questions and answers, how our deepest sorrows all fall within the dignity of being created in the image of God. And that has given us a distinctive voice, Jerem, for a restless generation who needs it. And I give thanks to you for that. And I praise God for you. So at this point in time, I'd like to invite Jerem uh, to come up. Uh, having said so many terrible things now, we should give him the right of reply. Um, so Jerem, if you would take a few moments, and then at the close, I'm going to ask Mark and Zach to join me. I know there's folks here from the seminary who'd like to take a few photos, but thank you, Jerem. This is the book that many have contributed to in your honor, each of which reflect many of the themes that you've long taught us. So thank you for leading us and serving us as you have. Amen. Thank you. Amen. I'm not going to simply say anything except thank you. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed and uh, just very, very moved. So uh, just appreciate you all being here. I uh, appreciate your encouraging words, Zach and Mark, both of you, and uh, bless you. And uh, just want to say thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs>